Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. This week we're back on the Hemingway Sensitive Knurling Tool. Last time we finished all of the straight milling, drilling, and reaming of all of the flat bar parts. And today we're gonna to mill all the curves, rounded ends, and corners. And to do that, we're gonna pull out the rotary table. I saw an inheritance machining post this week and it looks like he's in the process of making one of these too. Well, Brandon, this is the rotary table episode. I hear it's your favorite. The first parts we're going to start with are the locking tabs for the knurl pins. We got these milled roughly to shape last week, but we need to put the bevels on the edges of the blades and the curves on the back around the screw. And these are too small to really do much with the mill, so we're just going to work on them with some needle files over here in the bench vise. First job is just to file the bevels on the edges of the blades, and I'm just watching the back side of this and I'm gonna bring it down till it's exactly tangent with the bevel on the top. I gave up on the needle files. This is actually a six inch mill bastard file. This is a new old stock Nicholson file that came from eBay and it is by far my favorite file. You can see I just got those points to intersect. So we'll go ahead and flip it over and do the other side the same way. I'm using the base from my combination square to make sure these are in here at 45 degrees, and then I'm just eyeballing the file level with the top of the vise jaws. And that is close enough, especially for a part this small. There are two of these, but I won't make you watch me file both of them. I went ahead and turned up a filing fixture over on the lathe. This is just a piece of silver steel with a chamfer on the end that matches the bevel of the countersink in the parts. And I will just put both of them on this back to back. Just for scale, that is an M3 screw. Get the fixture screwed together here and tighten down. And actually getting these aligned turned out to be kind of challenging. As you can see, my fingers are not well suited for handling parts this size. I have found that on smooth round surfaces like this, the Knipex parallel jaw pliers do an excellent job of gripping them without really marring them up. In this case, since it is just a filing fixture, it's probably not that important, but I'm using the vise jaws here to try to align the parts or keep them aligned while I tighten this down. And then I'll come back and use the parallel jaw pliers to actually squish the parts into position. You can see they're slightly misaligned there, but a couple of squeezes with the parallel jaws bring them right into line. Then we can just clamp this between the vise jaws and file away. I'm using a long rocking motion on the stroke to try to follow that curve. This will get it generally into shape. And then once the file works its way down and comes in contact with the filing guide, it'll generally skate over that and recreate that curve. Now I didn't harden these, so the file is cutting into them, but I'm only gonna use them once. And so this will be totally suitable for this task. Flip it to the other corner. Do the other side, bring that down round, and finally finish with some long continuous strokes to make that as smooth as possible. Come back with a little bit of 400 grit emery to clean it up. For the curved surfaces, I'll just strop it over, and for the flat surfaces, I'll wrap the emery around a file and use that. That should be all we need this fixture for, so we can take it apart and see what we got. And all in all, I'm pretty happy with these for such small parts. I think they turned out great. Now the surface finish looks a little bit weird, but that's partly because of the macro lens. We are just so close to these tiny parts. All the rest of the parts are big enough to mill with the rotary table, but to use the rotary table, my beloved dual vice setup has to come off the mill. This is for sure an extravagance, but it's something that I've become quite accustomed to and I've really been enjoying. I really don't know how I survive without two vices. As long as we've got everything off the mill, we might as well clean up and check the condition of the table. These are precision flat ground stones and I'm just running them over the table trying to feel for any nicks or damage. And I'm feeling absolutely nothing. Those aluminum table protector trays are paying off. We'll get the rotary table up here. Now I ran the knee all the way down so I didn't have to lift this so high. So now I got to crank it back up. I actually do have a power feed for the Z sitting in a box here and we'll be putting that on shortly. I'm gonna go ahead and get the base of the rotary table squared up so that I can use it as a reference and you'll see why in a little bit. 
that's pretty straightforward. We've got that square, and now we need to center up the spindle on the axis of rotation of the rotary table. I'll just go ahead and run the quill down, and we'll get a rough centering just using the circles that are etched in the top of the rotary table. Then I'll bring in a dial indicator, and we'll indicate the bore and get it centered perfectly. My goal here is to have the rotary table square and to have the mill centered up on the bore. And we'll go ahead and set that as zero in the DRO so we can come back to it repeatedly to locate part features over the axis of the rotary table and to move to offsets from that position to locate parts that don't have features at the centers of the curves we need to cut. I'd like to do everything from this point on with a half inch R8 collet in the spindle. So I'll go ahead and get the collet loaded. And then I made some tools for centering the parts. These are just half inch silver steel with different diameters turned on the ends. And I will use those to locate the parts over the center of the rotary table. I've driven the mill to zero zero with the DRO. And then I'll go ahead and set up the parts on top of a piece of sacrificial aluminum here. So I won't cut into the table. I'm using a combination square to make sure that the part is aligned along the x-axis of the mill. That was the whole point of dialing in the base of the rotary table square. And now with the part located, I can come back with an end mill and actually mill a round end on the part. This is a half inch carbide end mill. This one happens to be from Lakeshore Carbide, uh, you know, no affiliation there. I just happen to like these, but you know, any half inch end mill would work. This is just mild steel. Now I have the mill set up so that I am at X zero and I am offset from the center of the rotary table in Y. Doing it this way allows me to see how far I am from that bore and knowing how wide the part is, I know what Y coordinate I have to come down to to end up cutting tangent to the sides. So I'm just slowly working my way down, milling a little bit at a time. This end mill can take a much bigger cut than this, but I'm not really sure about my setup. I'm hearing a lot of vibration. I'm not really quite sure where that's coming from yet. But since I have this all in the DRO, it's pretty easy to just drive back to zero, zero, put my alignment tool back in and see if we're still aligned. And we are still aligned, so nothing moved. So I went ahead and just uh, switched over to the other side so I can see better because I've got the end mill on the side towards me and just worked my way down to within about one thousandth of an inch of coming completely tangent. I don't actually want to touch because I don't want to risk overcutting. So I'll come within a thou, it'll leave a tiny sharp corner and I'll just buff that out on a scotch bright wheel and everything will look good. If I overcut it, it will look like an amateur job and I definitely don't want that. Blow out the chips here and see where we ended up. And honestly, the surface finish on that is much better than I was expecting. I can live with that. Now I made several of these alignment tools, one for each diameter in the parts for this knurling tool. So we'll go ahead and set up the other end of the same part using a different diameter pin. And we'll just proceed in the same way, whittle it down to dimension. And that looks fantastic. I can understand why some people are fond of the rotary table. Next up, we need to round the back ends of the knurl arms. This is exactly the same process that we used on the straps. Of course, the pin diameters are different, but we'll just line it up the same way, use the square to get it square with the coordinate system of the mill, and just proceed to round the end with the half inch end mill. I was a little bit concerned about the security of this setup, given that the material is much thicker. This is half inch thick steel, but it turned out to be much easier to cut. I think what's going on here is that the end mill has more than one flute engaged at the same time. By the time one flute leaves the edge of the part, the next one is already engaged. There's much less hammering and the cutting here went much smoother. Did exactly the same thing, just continued to whittle it down until I got within one thousandth of the theoretical tangent point. And like I said, this thing just cut beautifully and it was nice and quiet. It did turn out the vibration I was hearing earlier was the buttons on the pneumatic switches for the power drawbar. Uh, they're loose in the housing. It's just how the thing is built. So if you get any hammering, they rattle. But with this cut, because it's so much smoother, I don't really hear that. I did try coming back at the end with a climb cut to see if it improved the surface finish, but it really didn't take any material off. And honestly, the surface finish on these is already fantastic. 
just look at that. Yeah, I could not be happier with that. Second arm is exactly the same, except of course the diameter of the hole is a little bit different. I was really curious to see how accurately placed these holes were because they are just drilled and then reamed, but man, the wall thickness on this is really consistent. It's well under a thousandth of an inch variation. Next up, we need to cut the concave curves in the ends of the knurling arms. Now, in this case, we don't actually have a hole to center the curve around, so I don't have any way to locate that. However, I do know the offset between the theoretical center of that curve and the neural pin hole in the end of the arm. So I have driven the mill to the inverse of those coordinates, and I will locate that hole off center using a pin in the spindle. And then once I have this squared up and clamped down, the center axis of the rotary table is now at the theoretical center of that curve. So it should be a matter of just bringing the spindle down and cutting that curve in multiple passes. Now, because of the way I set this up and because I had the aluminum sticking out, I did have to make a few passes to clear the aluminum before I actually got to the steel part. And the aluminum ended up being a little bit of a problem. The coating on this end mill is titanium aluminum nitride. And if you've never tried to cut aluminum with one of these, don't. The aluminum tends to weld to the coating, and so you can hear it chattering and crunching and squeaking and making all kinds of noise. And what's happening is those chips are getting peeled off the aluminum, and then they're spinning around and getting compressed back between the end mill and the part again. And that chip weld is building up and causing issues in the cut. I eventually discovered that as long as I keep a stream of air on it while it's cutting, they tend to come out and not get recut, and it does work a little bit better. Ideally, a, a, a different kind of end mill, like maybe a high-speed steel end mill with no coating or a different coating that would play better with aluminum would suffice here, but really there aren't a lot of coatings that work with both aluminum and steel. I did come back after the last pass and try to make a climb cut to see if it would change the surface finish, but honestly, the surface finish was fine. Just like when we were rounding the ends, this end mill is just doing a beautiful job. You can see the remnants of the welded chips there, and they do just knock off, so really it was a matter of them just building up and getting compressed. They're not really solidly welded to the end mill. Once again, that surface finish is wonderful. I like it. Let me do the other one and then we'll switch up the setup to do the outside. To cut the convex side of the arm, I have flipped the part around so that the cut side will be toward me and I can see what I'm doing. And I have offset to the right and down the distance between the hole in the end of the part and the theoretical center of the curve. So that once again, the center of the curve will be aligned with the axis of the rotary table. Now, the inside and outside curves on these arms have their centers in different positions, so you have to be pretty careful to make sure you don't screw it up. And maybe I was careful enough, or maybe I just got lucky. Then the process is exactly the same. I've moved over to X0, and I've pulled down to the negative side in Y, and I will just work my way in, rotating the table back and forth until I come up to very close to the tangent point. It's like I overestimated that, I'll back off a little bit until we just start cutting the end and then we'll take this nice and easy in multiple passes there's no reason to be in a hurry here i would hate to get to this point with so much work into these parts and then have something shift in the setup you can see i pulled the aluminum back i learned my lesson i don't really want to be cutting that if i can avoid it once again i know exactly where the tangent point should be theoretically based on the radius of the curve and the diameter of the cutter and I'm going to work up to where I'm within about a thousandth of an inch of that point. I really do not want to touch the side of the part. I do not want to risk gouging it and, you know, making it look like an amateur with a beaver made this thing. So I'll work up to within a thousandth and then I'll take it over to the Scotch-Brite wheel later and I'll just soften up the tiny, tiny little edge that's left. Well, I think that's going to work. We still need to round the end, but let me do the other arm first. This operation is just like rounding the ends of the other parts. We do have a bore right in the center of the curve radius, so that makes that part easy. 
The thing that makes this a little bit more difficult though is that I don't actually know the tangent angle. So with the previous parts, I had Sharpie marks on the scale around the sides of the rotary table. So I knew exactly when it was horizontal because we lined the part up with a square and I knew exactly at what angle I would encounter the tangent point. So I could run up to within one thou of the tangent point. I knew exactly where that was and I could avoid gouging the part. Here, because we're intersecting two different curves with two different radii at two different angles, I didn't know exactly what that angle was. I probably could have spent some time in CAD figuring it out, but I decided to just wing it. Now I do know at about what Y coordinate I should encounter the tangent point. So as long as I stay a thou or two off of that, and then just sort of fish around and listen very carefully for when it starts and stops cutting, I can pretty much tell where the start and end point of my curve should be. And honestly, it worked pretty well. I was really worried once again that I'd put some dull beaver marks in the edges of the part, but it ended up not being a problem. Turns out it's pretty easy to hear when it stops cutting. As long as you don't try to get greedy and get that to come completely flush, it's fine. And again, because the radius of this is so much smaller, it is going to be even less noticeable when I round over that tiny, tiny little crest with the scotch bright wheel. You won't even be able to tell it's there. In fact, you can barely even tell it's there now. Next up are the side plates, and these just need the corners rounded. Now, the first corner here, we can do the same as we did with all the other parts because there is a hole right at the center of the radius. So we can just position it with the pin, clamp it down, and mill off the corner. However, some of the other corners of this part don't have any holes in them. So we'll go ahead and set up some stops to accurately position the part. We'll set up this one clamp with just a point contact on the one side, and then we'll set up a parallel here flat on the rotary table with a line contact against the other side. That'll give us a way to square it against the end of the parallel and then slide it over to contact that clamp and we can get the part into the same position over and over again. So we can just rotate it, square it up, move it over to touch the clamp, clamp it down, and we can mill off another corner. Now this one actually does have a hole, so we could have located it with the pin, but since we have the stop set up on the table, we don't need to. We can just bring this around, mill off that corner, and then rotate it again to get the next corner. Now this is the first one that doesn't actually have a hole, but the process is exactly the same. We'll just mill that round, rotate it again, and hit the fourth corner. Having the fixture set up makes short work of that. And you can see, once again, it just does a beautiful job. Those came nice and tangent, very happy with that. As long as we got the fixture set up, we can easily just rotate in the other part and just knock all four corners off of it as well. Nice and easy. The last part we need to round is the center spacer. And this is what Hemingway calls the distance piece, because this is what sets the spacing and the free play in the mechanism. Now this part does present a little bit of a challenge because it's so short. There's not really a good way to get two clamps on it. And with only one clamp on it, it's pretty easy for the part to rotate. So we've got to do something different. You can see I've swapped in a quarter inch thick scrap of aluminum for the spacer underneath it. And we're gonna drill and tap an M6 hole here so we can use a socket head cap screw to hold this end of the part down. That way we can have two clamping points on the part. We'll just go ahead and punch a hole through here. This is tapping size for M6. And then we'll come back with a spiral point tap and power tap the hole. I'm using A9 as a lubricant for cutting aluminum. I've been using it for years and it works really well. There's lots of things you can use, but A9 is nice and simple and it's always worked for me. I'm gonna get the tap out of the way. You always remove the tool when you're done with it, lest you embed it in your hand or break it off. Ask me how I know. An M6 cap screw will go in here and we can just go ahead and tighten that down. And unfortunately, I did not put the second clamp on the tail of that aluminum piece. Not only 
do we need to have the steel part clamped down in two places? The aluminum base plate also needs to be clamped in two places. I was gonna do it after I tighten the screw, but that was too late because I already managed to move the setup. So I just kind of held this together, tried to keep the screw hole aligned, realigned this with a pin and the chamfer in the top of that hole, since I didn't actually make an alignment tool that was the right size for that hole, got the second clamp on the tail of the aluminum piece, and then retightened the screw. This time nothing moved. So now we've got two clamping points on the aluminum base and two clamping points on the steel part. Start by just clearing away some of this aluminum so that we have room for the end mill to work. I am using the A9 on the aluminum and that does seem to help with the chip welding on the end mill. And then just like every other single part we've done today, I'll work down to about a thousandth of an inch off of the tangent point, work it around and clean up that rounded end. And just like every other part we've done today, the surface finish turned out just beautiful. That's it for the rotary table work. This is the first time I've actually spent a lot of time with the rotary table, and I think Brandon may be onto something. I had a lot of fun with it. Next up, we've got some parts with a mix of lathe and millwork in brass and steel, and we'll continue working on those next time. Feel free to subscribe so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, leave me a comment, and maybe consider supporting the channel over on Patreon. Patrons can download files for all of my projects and get a little sneak peek behind the scenes. Thank you for watching.